you could be doing in terms of creating a, a reality. And this is um, a study at the University of Bonn into whether we live in a simulation. And uh, this is a report. They, uh, they say that they may have evidence that the universe is a computer simulation. They pointed out in a paper called Constraints on the Universe as a Numerical Simulation that simply being a simulation would create its own laws of physics that would limit possibility. I said in books years ago, the laws of physics that we think are laws of physics here are not universal. They're the laws of physics in the way this reality works. That's all. They're not universal. Um, you know, uh, what are the laws of physics? Click, click, enter. Whatever you bloody make them. Scientists talk about a phenomenon known as the GZK cutoff which is an apparent boundary for cosmic ray particles caused by the interaction with cosmic background radiation. The University of Bonn paper says that this pattern of constraint mirrors what you would find with a computer simulation. They say that like a prisoner in a pitch black cell, we would not be able to see the walls of our prison. And this is... Uh this is a song I wrote earlier this year called people say
So you're quite knowledgeable about the justice system now, um, but I think that a lot of people when they go into the justice system uh, maybe don't have that much knowledge of the process. So I'm just wondering what you think was your best resource to learn about the process and to reach the level of understanding that you're at now. Good question. Well, actually, I began reading when I was in. Like I told you, from 93 to 97, I was almost in complete hysterics for four years almost. I was rarely sleeping, constantly looking over my shoulder, wondering if this is the day I'm going to die. And that's what it was like for me, right until the day I got over on bail. Is this the day I'm going to die? Which was a definite possibility. And I didn't like the uncertainty of that. And one day, I was out in the big yard. After a workout, I, I used to do weights. I used to be along this one where I was in weights. But I was, I, I, why I began reading the way I did, because I could always read. But I used to begin reading with purpose. I started looking around the big yard. And I saw people playing cards and walking the track and jogging and working out, doing weeds, working their garden, Con uh, just daily living in there. And the question was hit me why do Christians run the way they do? Was it the base one? What are Christians? Why do they run the way they do? And often my quest. I've read novels over the years, I've read storybooks, fancy books. The Wheel of Time series was tremendous. I never got to the end of that. But, uh, but I was reading textbooks. And I was reading criminology books, sociology books, all this kind of stuff. And I wasn't really absorbing it exactly, but there were certain ideas, certain concepts in there that were catching my attention when I was in. And, uh, To this day, I'll never understand why anybody would want to become a gender. I still don't. Because jail guards aren't paid to think. They're not paid to think. They're paid to observe. They're paid to follow orders. If you don't observe and follow orders, you're going to be out of the ranks. How do prisons run, and why do prisons run the way they do? Those were the two questions in 97 or 98, whichever year it was, that sent me off on my journey to read with purpose, to figure out what are prisons. And when you think about prisons, you have to think about the word in, institution, in, institutionalized, internalized, internal. They are designed to keep things in, simply, not let anything out. So, when you consider prisons, you have to consider the word in. And so, prisons, prisons are part of the justice system. You, you commit a crime, you get arrested, you go to trial, you get convicted, and off to prison you go. Pretty simple. They are... But the infrastructure, the basic infrastructure of prison is pretty straightforward. No matter what, where the prison is in the world, no matter what the prison is, you know, even if it's the county jail or a big federal prison, they're all built the same way. There is an A and D area, ad admissions and discharge. There is a V and C area, visits and communication. That's where the mail comes in, uh, fa your family comes in for visits to see you. Uh, there are private rooms in there for, for lawyer meetings and various other people that come from the street. There are and administration areas, wardens building, healthcare area, social and cultural administration building, the chapel, the kitchen, segregation, 
And then there's living areas. Where I was in Workworth, there were five units. And in each of those units, there are six ranges from label A through F. In, in each range, there are 17 cells. The first four on opposite sides of the corridor, the first four of them are usually double bunk cells. There is a communal shower at the end of the range. Ours had one shower, so everybody took their turns to shower. But there are also common room areas with TVs, uh, with games. Uh, there's tables in there for your, to play your games, Monopoly, Risk, Cribbage, Bridge, Dominoes, whatever you're into. There's fridges in there, there's sinks in there. But there's also administration offices within each unit for your parole officer, for the guards. There's a general laundry area. There's various office areas for inmate groups and various counselors to meet with inmates. There, there, there is a big yard where, where there's baseball diamonds and, and what could be a soccer football field. There's a track. You walk the track or jog. The, there, there's a weightlifting area in the yard. There is a, a garden area. For, for guys to do a little gardening. Um, there are shop areas, uh, automotive, electrical, plumbers, where guys could actually get their tickets in there for, for this or that. But in Workworth, there's also a, a, a crown corporation called Corcan, which creates various items depending on the prison, and they sell these items, desks, chairs, beds, matches, whatever, to the other prisons. And this is where inmates can go to get uh, get paid on top of their institutional pay, which I'll get into later. There are there is a financial building outside of the outside of the fence which takes care of of accounting, you know what I mean? Uh, um, they're in charge of the inmate accounts, financial accounts. And now this, that's pretty much it for, uh, for what the basic setup for prison is. And around the main property there's always a fence. And within the property itself there's various fences, gates, and, and such like that. But in the main, main I'd say communal community area of the prisons, the walkways and all this kind of stuff. There's all kinds of gates and fences and doors and and everything else. It's all about control. It's all about control of the flow of the population in there. And now that you understand the basic structure of a prison, you gotta get some people in there. It's about anomie, mon ami, if you understand that concept. An anomie? Explain it to everybody. That's what it's about. Prisons are daily practice in anomie. Daily. They break your connections to your family. If, if you have a tight circle of friends there, they, they'll break that connection. They'll break connection to your home, and in the end, they break connection to yourself, which sometimes leads to suicide. But that's what they do, because prisons are a warehouse. They're not there to correct nothing, to correct behavior. It's an industry. I was, in, I was a product on a shelf that was easily re re replaceable. They didn't give a shit if I lived or died. It, uh, 
But when I was going through it, I wasn't conscientious of it on these terms that I'm talking here now. I went until I had U of T and started talking to sociology professors who clarified things for me in terms of concepts and definition and what that meant. But it's also a practice in strain theory, prisons. How much strain can you take before you strike out in, in a criminally violent act? That's what the guards do too, antagonize. If we're all convicts, they'll whisper in your ear to kill the guy beside you. That's what they do. They'll work out a deal with you to bring drugs so you can traffic their drugs in the prison. And then when, when you guys get caught, you're going to be the one going down for it. From top to bottom, prisons are nothing but corruption. Cesspool, corruption, top to fucking bottom. One of the biggest fallacies if prison is that the wardens run it. That's bullshit. Well, wardens don't run shit in the prisons. That's why they, they cycle them from prison to prison every three years. Because they don't run shit. It's the security man, middle man that do. And the more I saw it, the more I wonder how why would anybody want to do this job? Because it's their job to dehumanize me. If you were there, it would be there to dehumanize you. To turn you into something subhuman. I wouldn't even say, like I said before, feral adult. We, you understand where I'm going with it? Feral children, feral adult, animalistic. Which is even, isn't even a totally 100% accurate term because because human beings are the only beings on this fucking planet that prey on each other like this. Do you want to turn you into something subhuman? For what? Job security. To keep the beds full. Keep the beds full. That's what your job is, to dehumanize you into believing and taking away your, increasing your level of anomie and increasing levels of strain in your life where you believe the only, only place you can be in the instrument and belong in this world is prison. That's what prisons do. They turn you into something subhuman I can't even call animal-like. I'm, I'm thinking subhuman man-like. That's what they do. And that's why a lot of convicts have a hard time getting out. When they get out, they, they have this limited view of what freedom is in a, of a mere physical notion. It's a physical thing in prison, out of prison. I'm free, I'm out of prison, I'm free. But freedom has nothing to do with physicality. Freedom. Freedom's here. Freedom's in here. As uh, Danny Dufresne and Shawshank said about music, it's in here, man. They can't take that away. And that, there's truth to that. Very little good actually comes out of prisons. Prisons are environments to reprogram re people. They reprogram people, they And they strip people of, of free thinking, freedom of choice, freedom of ideas, freedom of sharing. Prisons strip freedom, and very little can come from that. I talked about the idea of, of this anomie. Anomie was a concept by Emil Durkheim in, in the 1800s. He studied suicides. <clears throat> and anomie, to put it in the simplest terms I can, anomie is a feeling of disconnectedness. Disconnectedness from people, places, and things. No belonging. Nowhere to be. You don't know where you belong. 
That's what anomie is. And sometimes, as your level of anomie rises, you get disconnected from yourself. Which, which, which often leads to suicide. But prisons are also about strain theory. And they talk about, people have talked about strain theory from a, like sociologists of the past, like Merton, that talked about how, how strain theory is related to crime and all this kind of stuff. You mean how much strain can you take before you, you commit a crime idea? But I'm gonna take that a little further because for me and where it applies to prison, it's how much strain can you endure before you strike out in a violent criminal act. That's what... That's what strain theory is. For me, at least. So, like I said, prisons are about reprogramming people. It's, it's very insidious. And it's a very evil thing to do to somebody. To re re reprogram people into high levels of anomie with high levels of strain theory to boot. There are two groups of people being reprogrammed in prisons. The staff and the convict. And neither group fully understands that it's happening and most aren't even aware of it. Each be in program for various reasons. But the main reason that I could see is that that these guards and convicts are, are being reprogrammed to hate. And it's done through division of of humanity. It takes the the normal and turns it into the abnormal where the, it's viewed to them after from through their perception that their this abnormality is normal and those who speak against it are considered abnormal and those that that are okay with it and work within it and push that agenda they are considered normal <clears throat> so the cons is reprogramming when you go to prison there is a reality shift everything from birth to entering prison is inverted everything that you're taught from your family, from your community, from your schooling, everything around you outside of prison is turned upside down. Love is turned into hate. Honesty is turned into treachery. Nonviolence is turned into violence. Normal is turned to the abnormal. But the same thing can be said for, for the staff, for the guards. The guard's job is to observe the convicts, to control the movement, to turn the key. But their job is also to cause division of people, not only within the prison, but division of people out on the street, these convicts' communities that they're going to go back to. They create chaos in people's lives. They create chaos within the prison because they want to keep it like that for things like job security. But the thing is, in this process of inversion, what I have seen 
is these guards wake up each day to go to a profession to hate, to hate the convict, to hate everything about the convict. So see, both groups are being reprogrammed to hate. I remember being told this a lot when I was in over those 12 years when I was in there. By God, tell me this. They told me things like that they are a lifer too, but on the installment plan. And my idea was this. My response to them was this. Well, boo-hoo. Because they are there by choice. And it could be argued that the convict is there by choice by committing their crime and everything else. But I was not there by choice. You see, that's why I could see past that. I could see past these, these limited perspectives of, of division. You see, so I would throw it back to them. Well, you're here by choice. What kind of person does that make you? to come to a job where your job is to dehumanize and hate and create chaos. Because it always made me wonder what kind of personal lives they've had. They lead, they lead living every day with that kind of hate and going back to their homes and go and put it aside. So they may be a life run installment plan, but they are there by choice. They are there to dehumanize for the purpose of a paycheck. Put their lives on the line for sixty, seventy thousand dollars every day in order to hate. Because this is, there comes to a point when you hate so much, when you're spewing out this hate, that eventually you will hate yourself. So you see, as much as the guards are dehumanizing the convict through various ways, different programs, they say in their programs, it always comes back down to programming, reprogramming, but they call it programs. But the thing is, most people don't see it. For various reasons which I really don't understand so I cannot really identify it but they do not see this hate that they live in on what it's doing to themselves whether you're a con or a staff but largely from my experience much of the problems that do exist within a prison are caused by the staff because they are directed to follow orders coming from national headquarters, regional headquarters, that are telling them how to think, how to do their job, re regardless of their, of their personal feelings, you see? So they bury that. Khan and Guard, they, they all bury this, a lot of them. So, so you think about the convict. Most convicts in there, when they're in there, mainly to, to take up hours in the day, the exercise, the workout, I did. But what a lot of them do, what a lot of them never saw, in certain types of disciplines, that they were disciplining themselves to strike out in violence first. Where I, I've always been raised to believe, and, and I do my best to believe in, in violence is the last resort, you see? And the way a lot of the convicts discipline themselves towards violence is by hitting the heavy bag. They get stressed out and angry and anxiety ridden. So, to get that energy out, they go to the heavy bag 
I'm going to get this energy out of me and I'm angry and I'm angry and I'm going to hit bang, bang, bang. But in the end, all they're doing is disciplining themselves to strike out in violence first, as a first resort, as a first thing to do. So when they do get out, that that plays to to reoffenses and recidivism and all this kind of ideas. But what I I noticed that I could finally put a word to once and for all what prisons do is they create feral adults purposely with purpose for the purpose of getting these these convicts continuing to come back Be, because of their limited language skills and, and their limited avenues and different coping mechanisms you see so when they hit the street when stressful situations happen they want to strike out in violence I have experienced that myself I saw it for myself because I lived it you see and I had trouble sometimes when when it first got out which I still have trouble with I'm not saying I strike out in violence first thing to tell you the truth, I, but it's, it's the reprogramming of the mind rather than the cultivation of the heart that goes on in these prisons. Because when you think about feral children, because this idea of feral adults is similar to feral children of isolation from, from human contact. You see, to be isolated, to accept those cultural norms of that society, etc., etc., etc. So when you accept, excuse me, and the norms of a prison, those will will be your norms when you get up. Excuse me. So in, in, in the end, prisons profoundly limit the perceptions of those within it, both con and guard. And because it is an institution designed to keep things in, all the public hears about is these animals in prison. So that's all, so when they come out, that's all they're seen as. They're seen as subhuman. Who belong in prison. And the sad thing about that is sometimes, is the convict willingly goes back to prison because he sees no hope, he sees no beauty in life. All he wants is to go back to prison where he thinks he belongs. First of all, I want to say thank you for being here and sharing your story. Uh, I can imagine it takes a lot of courage to be here yourself, so thank you for that. Um, I just hear you talking about uh, your anger, obviously, rightfully so. And I also heard your song say um, something along the lines of people ask me why I forgave a man I should hate. Could you tell me a little bit more about that like, healing journey for you and that process of forgiveness once you came out? Uh, uh, I don't, to tell you the truth, I really don't know where, where that come from. You need to forgive Smith the way I did. When that happened at the Gulf of Harvey, no one knew, nobody knew what I was going to say, not even me. I knew he was going to apologize to me. And 
that's why. And I remember I was standing there, standing in front of Charles Smith there, and he apologized to me. I'm looking at him, and I took a big pause, and I looked at Judge Coach, and we made eye contact. You know how you make a slow eye contact with somebody? We made eye contact that he wouldn't believe. And he had this worried look on his face, because he didn't know what I was going to say. I'm just looking at him. Then I took a breath, and when I turned to open up my eyes, I looked at Smith and I said what I said. That I forgive him. Because truthfully, I. It's going to sound a little bit cliche, but life's too short to be hung up on hate. That's what I'm really learning these days. Life's too short to be hung up on hate. <clears throat> like this. I lived with so much hate for so long that, that in a way, I don't know how to live without it sometimes. You know what I mean? And that scares me, that bothers me. But I, uh, I constantly think about what my elder told me. Vern Harper, he, uh, don't let them break you. Never lose track of who you are. Don't lose sight of the truth the way you know it. Never abandon the truth. You know, and maybe that's where that comes from. That I've got to heal eventually. I got to do this myself. I can't be handheld about it. Because nothing was ever sugarcoated in my life. <clears throat> but at the same time, I got to get over this somehow, and I got to make that first step. And maybe forgiving Smith was the first step of my own healing. You know what I mean? Because I can get mad and talk about this, that, Smith, and you know, and start swearing around here. But what's that going to get anybody? It's not going to get me anything except worked up. Worked up to the point where I can't be around anybody. You know what I mean? Because that's what these talks do to me sometimes. They get me, it's almost like pulling off a scar every time I do these talks, you know what I mean? But, but I do find them healing because every hateful word I, be, I say here it stays here. That what I try to keep it here, leave it here, where I'm going home with one last hateful word. One last anger, a angry sentiment, and it's a daily process with me that I have to do that. But I don't know where it comes. Literally, I don't know where it comes from in me to forgive that man or anything like that. But I don't specifically blame him solely. It's it wasn't him solely that did this. I see. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Life is too short for hate. And I, and I still can't understand why anybody would make a career out of hate. Because when you make a career out of hate, you live with it. And you live with it. And then you pass that hate along from guard to convict, convict to guard. But even more so than that, You pass it on to the next generation. And they will know only hate. And so on and so on. It must have been about 2003 when things really changed in my perspective in there where it applies to Aboriginal culture. I say this because there was a shift in the Aboriginal consciousness, at least that I saw at the time. I couldn't put words to it. I can now. But it was about 2003 that this happened. When I got to Workworth, it was 95. And that's where I reunited with my elder, Vern Harper. And uh, he sweat with us and gave us teachings and got to know us and everything like that, socialized with us. But when 2001 came around, about there, right around there, that time era, they drummed him out. And they drummed him out by not renewing his contract as our elder. And they did so because what he was doing, what he'd done in those six years 
I'd worked with was he he built up the solidarity within the Native Brotherhood so high that I can't even believe he was able to do this. He, uh, it came to a point where when we'd go for the sweats, there'd be so many of us, 30 to 50 guys, that would want to sweat and go through those sweats because of the solidarity. That he became, began splitting the day up into two sweats. He'd conduct one, and but he started training some of us on how to conduct sweats. In the later years, he started training me. So they drummed him out. They drummed him out because a prison cannot have solidarity among any group of inmates. Because when you speak with one voice, you're strength in that. When you stand together, there is strength in that as well. And a prison cannot have solidarity. They must have division among, among the inmates, among the prisoners, among the, and in this case, among the Native Brotherhood. So, so they drummed them out. We, ha we went through a two-year period where we did not have any elders coming in. No programs, no elders, no ceremonies. So, about two years later, they, they brought in two elders of the Medewin influence. And they were from the Curb Lake area, if I'm not mistaken. And then things were getting good again. We were all sweating again. We were, we were getting that healing. You see. And then one night, I can I can't even tell you the date because I don't remember the date. But there was one night after our, our supper, going into the evening rec time period, that that this elder that was doing the sweats called us down to the sweat lodge area and we all sat in a circle and this elder with his own feather in his hand commenced to tell us that he was not our brothers that we had no rights and he had no obligation to us and believe me that made an effect on people made an effect on me in particular because after that, all but five guys would sweat with him. I would never sweat with that man again. I don't even consider him an elder. But looking back then to what I've experienced today, the Aboriginal culture and consciousness have shifted. It's shifted to one of exclusion rather than inclusion. It created conflict and chaos within the Brotherhood, not only as a group, but within the person. In me it did at least. It created hopelessness and strain. That was a very bad thing that happened there. But also during that time period, I became aware of certain things that I'm only now putting words to. Like the word as. It's a very interesting word, that word as. And to, to apply it to this, which came, slapped me in the face almost. Not only in recent weeks, but back then it did, did too, but not on so much of a conscious level, more of a subconscious, like it was a slap in the face. Because as, it, it's used by many people, everybody uses it, I use it sometimes. But it's used by many people to hide. 
They use it to turn a blind eye to corruption and injustice around them. And it's used by some people to, to justify their own corruption and injustice that they engage in. I would even go as far as say it's used by our Aboriginal leaders of today, probably. Okay. So there's the word as. But as, unfortunately, it strips the person of empathy. The ability to put yourself in another pe person's shoes or position. It's a moral compass of sorts, empathy. Your actions towards other people are dictated by the empathy that you feel towards them before you do something or say something. And sometimes I get lost in that myself like everybody else does. You see, without empathy, you have no moral compass. You have no emotional consequences of your actions because you believe what you're doing is right and you can do it just because. But just like living with hate that gets passed on to the next generations, so does lack of empathy or empathy itself. Either the empathy gets passed on or lack thereof. And to me, it's always, it, it's, it's become, a, with the lack of empathy, it reminds me of a psychopath that just does what they want because they have no conscience. You see? So, So now, going back to the lack of empathy and, and all that kind of stuff, to put it into perspective for people. In 97, 98, around there, the Aboriginal Guards of Workworth Institution approached Vern Harper and the Native Brotherhood because they wanted our assistance, our backing, to have their back. And they wanted their back because of the f Racism that they were enduring by their colleagues, other guards, by the institution, the institution. It got so bad for them that, that, that they had to hide, so, so to speak. They started doing their job in the shadows of the prison, working in segregation, for example. But we told them we couldn't help them. In the end, we sat on this and we discussed it and everything, but we told them we could not help them. And we won't help them. So fast forward. I get out in 2005, I'm living in Toronto, and one of my cousins called me, and she told me she just completed her course to become a jail guard, but she wasn't a guard yet. She wasn't employed yet, but she called me and, and she was picking my brain about the prison environment of what it was and how it was in there. To make a long story short, I told her what we told those jail guards. And what we, and it turns out to be one of the most harshest truths that I know to exist within a, a prison. I, I told her not to be a jail guard, just like we, we told those guards we're not going to help them. And this is why. You take any prison out there, whatever prison it is, if, if the Aboriginal population happens to be fighting for their human rights, 
or their aboriginal rights under the laws and all this kind of stuff. Just fighting for our rights. And push came to shove. And an aboriginal guard is ordered to put a bullet in an aboriginal inmate's head. And he doesn't, he or she doesn't, there's going to be one in theirs. And that is one of the harshest truths that I know to exist within the prison environment. So I was talking with one of my uncles and one of my brothers the other day, talking about this stuff. And their response to me was a, a response that is almost a go-to response when faced with an argument like this. And it goes something like this. Well, you gotta make 11. Right? That's always it. You always gotta make 11. And my response to them, and it will always be, why do you have to make a living stripping your own people and yourself or somebody else in general? Why do you have to make a living Stripping another of their human dignity and their rights for money. And I will, I never will understand that.
I don't 